and we'll get going. Um, what I'm going to try and do today is, is um, look, I've got things prepared, but, but I'm also happy just at this stage um, just to take advice or questions or, you know, to run it as you want to run it. So, um, yeah, I'll get started, but please just jump in or if anyone's going to think they want to lead off with, um, let's do it so we can actually get, um, you know, get, get, get down to Tintax and actually discuss some important things. Does anyone have a question at this stage they'd like to ask? <clears throat> All right, well, what I'll do is I'll get going. And if anything comes up, please, um, please feel free to add it. Um, so what we're going to do today is, is just round out the unit. As I said to you last week, there'll be no new material, but there could be some things that seem new to us because it's, you know, we're, we're in a different place to when we were last time we looked at things. And so what we're going to do is go forward to the year 2030. I mean, we, we talk in education a lot about changes. And what I'd like to finish this session with today is a look at the exam from this unit six years ago. Now, I actually sent it out to you on the forum to have a look. Um, and that was only part of it. You know, this, this unit six years ago used to do um, physical sciences, uh, chemical sciences, biological and earth and space. So it was all done in one unit. And, and we'll, you know, we'll look at the, in a short six years, just how much um, the focus on teaching has changed. But imagine we're going forward, 8.5 billion people, global temperatures are at least 1.2 degrees higher. Seas have risen 40 centimetres. There's a couple of uh, Pacific islands already underwater. Um, existing models desperately underestimate the rises. We can expect it to be even higher than 40 centimetres. Um, the ocean is now ice free every summer and several countries, because of their low lying levels, the Netherlands, for instance, Bangladesh, lose their, their primary um, fresh water sources as all the glaciers melt. So we've seen many cities, and we're seeing it now, aren't we, um, being absolutely decimated by, by climatic events. Um, we predict we're going to have 40 million environmental refugees settled away from their homelands. Um, okay, so Sarah cannot hear. Everyone else can hear. Sarah, just check your own volume. You may have it muted, your, your audio. So just check that. And we see, for instance, with, with um, you know, Rwanda many years ago and, and the Rohingya people in, in Burma, there's violent backlash from host countries. We're starting to see this um, right across the globe. Um, we see boats sailing around the Mediterranean with no, you know, loaded with refugees and nowhere to land. That's, that's passive backlash, but we're seeing violent backlash. And all of this is connected to our view that, you know, the world is not going to have enough. It's not a view, it's actually a reality. So when we look at this, we've got flooding and disasters, and these are costing billions of dollars annually. Now, just look at your own insurance policy. Um, living in Cairns, for instance, before I came to Townsville, um, my neighbour had an insurance policy of one year to insure his house. It cost him $2,800. Um, the following year, following the Melbourne bushfires, it cost him $13,800. So we're starting to see, um, you know, this whole new costing. It's like aeroplanes. You know, it won't be long in the future until when you're travelling on aeroplanes that large people will have to pay more for their seats because clearly they take up more space and way, way heavier. Um, and this is always the funny thing with Jetstar, isn't it? When you roll up at, at the airport, you, know, you, you go with Jetstar and every time you do, you swear you won't ever go with Jetstar again, but you do. And you rock up there and you've got this tiny little bag and they want to weigh it and they want to squeeze it into a square box and, and they do all that. And, and then, you know, you see some really small people roll up and, and their bag happens to be two kilos over the seven kilo limit. And so they're getting charged. And then immediately behind that really small person is a very large person. Um, usually a minor, um, usually somewhere you know, quite large, um, who weighs probably 50 to 60 kilos more than this small person and doesn't get charged any extra for that. But between countries, we're starting to see that change. Okay, we're starting to see um, governments with, with you know, um, disaster relief um, funds. And, and we're looking at with the farmers now. I mean, yes, there's a case for there, but, you know, Back at the time of settlement in Australia, and this is a contentious issue, um, but back at the time of settlement in Australia, you know, a lot of farmers were advised not to go and settle in the regions they settled, that it was unsustainable. But there was a huge land grab. The government supported them. Off they went and and so and so. So we're looking at, at critical social infrastructure and investment is going to be diverted away from our social needs, more towards social rescue, aid and repair. And one of the things I can tell you is that school funding will be part of that. We are going to see fundamental changes to schooling. Teachers will be laid off. Now, this is also a market demand because by 2020 in Queensland, we are going to have a projected 4,000 shortage of teachers. Okay, that's a significant shortage. 
isn't it, in such a very short period of time? 4,000 teachers. So we're going to have significant shortages. Um, teachers will be laid off. School, school hours will be reduced. I mean, we'll call it streamlining, but there'll be different ways of education. Inter instructional hours will be cut. Total years of schooling may well be reduced. Um, but some regions we're going to see convergence of economic, environmental, and social um, crises. And, and in those regions, we're starting to see new initiatives emerge. So we're starting to see new programs and priorities. We're starting to see new curricula and new types of schools. And we're starting to look at a new educational path, okay, to look at life on a changing planet. And here is where science education fits in. And we'll look at this later when we go back to the, the assessment for this, this subject, this unit, just six years ago. So in other words, we're going back to the future. We're going back to a time um, where the Equinox Summit, this fabulous summit running Canada, um, where a group of the world's leaders, you know, leading thought um, and change makers gather. And, and what they do is they talk about how the future is going to look. And when they look at schooling, by the, they predict by the year 2030, there'll be no grades, no exams, no teachers. Well, there'll still be teachers, but, you know, we, we may be, for instance, um, on a little robotic iPad um, moving around a classroom like a head on a stick where we can actually you know go around students and look over their shoulders through our little iPad eyes and we can be based somewhere else in, in some other building or, or institution or, or set up. So we're looking at a whole range of different changes. Some of the ones they predict about and talked about in this, this um, article, stage-based not age-based learning and stage-based again Qualitative portfolio assessment. Now, I know a couple of you are talking about portfolio assessment for reforms and recommendations in assessment task number two. And we're also going to see including NGOs, private organisations and the public engaged in the schooling process. So what that means is um, kids are going to be taught not just by teachers. There'll be people coming in from organisations. There'll be, you know, people outside of the education system. Teachers will spend half their time in schools, half their time working in organisations. We're going to see quite a different uh, scenario emerging. And this is the prediction and also, I think, partly the wish of the people who attend the Economic Summit and write global policy. So we're going to get rid of grades 9 to 12 and we're going to replace them with a project-based system, a vertically integrated upper school. Um, students are going to learn as they progress through material and they're not going to be held back by age-related curricula. So as exciting as we think the, the Australian curriculum is, um, it's actually probably getting quite um, quite backward already. I was looking at some of the year 11 and 12 subjects yesterday under the new designs um, from the QCCA. Um, and look, having taught the baccalaureate in a high school before, um, it's a really, really advanced degree. It's actually the world's best secondary education system. Um, and the QCCA have actually basically ripped off the baccalaureate. So it's really interesting to see that you know, they've moved towards a senior model of schooling that is much more global and much more flexible. And the time students spend in school is not going to be dependent on their age, but on their ability to perform. So we may see a child complete senior schooling at age 15. It may not be unusual. We're going to see project-based learning. And that is we're going to see the the mind science, brain science. We, we know that kids basically, you know, disengagement is a problem here um, in schooling. Um, we know that children in year two are getting suspended. The ex expulsion rates in, in grade prep in year two are amongst the highest across the school years. So we're seeing students basically being forced to learn things that they don't, um, you know, that don't motivate them and don't engage them, part of assessment task number two. And so the aim is to try and get you know, deal with underachievement, and that is by using brain science to actually structure individual programs for students. And we can go on and look at all of these. Um, we can record accomplishments on, on quantitative value, you know, without a quantitative value. So we're moving away from marks and grades. Um, and you know, this is some of the things that probably an education system. Um, okay. Someone is saying Sarah came in a different way. Sarah, you may need to log back in. It's still the same old link. Have a look and it is still the same old link. So we just, um, sometimes Zoom can be a little bit unpredictable. So just if you, you want to close down or leave the meeting and come back in via the same link, it should work. Um, and we can look at, you know, pursuing passions. So kids working on, on 360 degree assessment, allowing them to come through and do, you know, get rid of exams, remove the pressure and return learning to the fun and productive activity it used to be. So, and we're also going to look at networking engagement, learning as part of, you know, and Siemens talks about this in his philosophy of teaching called connectivism. 
you know, we know about constructivism, we know about constructionism, and now connectivism in 2005, Siemens published that quite a while ago now, so it's obviously morphed a bit, but we're going to move away from, you know, the notion, this belief that one teacher can handle the learning needs of 30 other people, it's nonsense. We were all born in communities, we're all social animals, we know really that the only way we're going to learn effectively is in networking and engagement, and, and therefore, um, just watch kids together. They learn so well from each other. It's only when a teacher steps in that they all stiffen up and things go cold. So, you know, we can have a look at all this stuff. There is a huge vision for where education is going, um, but I already think it's halfway there. And we'll look at some of the reasons why. Um, we'll talk this week about a problem with schooling. And when you talk to kids, they sense a clear divide between schooling and learning. Um, in other words, yeah, I'm at school, but it's not where I want to be. Um, I'm not learning anything. That used to be an oxymoron. Now it's a very, very common story. So our common assessment models, and these are some of the things we're critiquing in assessment NAS, uh, task number two, they constrain ambition. You know, and, and some of these primary connections units, when you look at it, um, put them in groups, get them doing group tasks. You know, a lot of kids that absolutely annoys. You know, we're seeing more and more kids for a range of reasons we'll discuss later coming on onto the autism spectrum and their capacity to work effectively with others um, is not good. They don't play well with others. You know, so what we need to do is get rid of um, the constraints and bring in enablers. Um, and school also um, doesn't really reflect the realities of the world. Now, I was at a high school, as I said, where we were teaching the baccalaureate and we had a deputy principal who was quite a large dumpy woman as they often seem to be. I don't know what that is. It must be genetic. Um, but anyway, that she decided that the senior boys should not have full contact sport, which was a really interesting decision. You know, any sport they played had to be touch. Um, now, the school actually had a rugby league um, program with direct pathways into the Broncos and also the Cowboys. Um, so it was a really interesting choice on her part to stamp out um, at, at physical contact and, and, and a culture of, as she described it, bullying and intimidation that occurred amongst the male students. Can I ask you what you think happened once she did that? Anybody like to hazard a guess? Um, Colin, did they take out their frustrations in the classroom? They absolutely did. Absolutely. Behaviour management or mismanagement and, and misbehaviour escalated. There was increased violence, there was theft, there was disruption. The entire school was at risk of breaking down. And, and of course, you know, being a, a thorn in the deputy principal's side, it was, it was my role to suggest to her that, you know, for a long, long time, this is how the male community in schools have actually organised themselves. You know, how they work out their hierarchy, how they work out how to be social because they like to bump into each other. They like to throw each other on the ground. This is how they organise themselves and sort themselves out. Um, and yet, you know, it's a really interesting, isn't it, when we move into the nanny state. Um, the problem with schooling is it, it gets more and more out of touch with reality. Um, and so we've managed to see schooling decouple itself from the idea of learning. You know, and somehow we've, we've got to make our way back there. Okay, we've got to make it back there. Um, and so Bromans, that's right, they did it more. And, and look, like, like Carl Jung said, anything we repress is going to come back at us bigger and bigger every time. And in an attempt to repress, uh, you know, male exploration, male expression um, in our young men, um, all it did was turn the volume up, you know, several degrees. So the Imagine 2030 project in schools talks about new teaching and learning ecologies. And again, it combines teaching approaches with brain technology. So it's all about neuroplasticity. So we're fine tuning, we're creating personal education plans for students. Schools are becoming community hubs. So there's you know, seamless connections in and out of cyberspace. Teachers, students and families are joining local and distant professions. And this is something, for instance, you know, I'm heavily involved in, in First Lego League. Um, actually rolled it out here in Australia back in 2006 and have been all around the world with it. Um, but when I talk about First Lego League, I rarely think about Australia. I actually think about Asia Pacific and Atlanta, Georgia. I think about all the countries and all the places where this community resides. Um, and certainly, even though it, it operates in schools, in towns where we've got 22 teams competing this year, it operates in schools and its teams are from schools and school communities, but they're not of schools. This is learning, this is new age learning that's happening outside of schools. And you know, having completed a recent STEM research project, the majority of STEM initiatives in Queensland 
even though you know they're getting 81 million dollars a year funding most of them happen outside school hours outside of assessment outside of formal reporting processes a lot of them are deemed to be extension activities so and we're also looking at innovative teachers and we're seeing this more and more the average career length for a teacher these days is five years now that may shock you by 2020 we are going to be chronically short of teachers the average career length is actually just five years um, even three years ago it used to be seven years so um, you know it's actually coming down dramatically teaching life is getting shorter the shelf life is getting shorter and shorter um, so what we're looking at doing is coming up with a new generation of teachers so we turn here to Oscar Wilde and the resources we provide for learners reflect their individual philosophy on education and schooling so if we're providing C to C and that's all we're providing then that's a statement about what we believe it's about the statement about the kind of world and environment we're trying to create and as Oscar Wilde says a world a map of the world that does not include utopia is not even worth glancing at for it leaves out the one country at which humanity is always landing and it's a brilliant insight isn't it and, and why can't we be that that passionate as teachers because certainly if we're not if we just fall back on the document trail then constantly we're going to see more and more disengagement amongst learners so this week I'm talk about some real science questions um, and you know a really interesting one here is for us think about it why can't any any global telcos big giant companies getting any indemnity insurance from Lloyds of London or Allianz, the world's two largest insurers. Think about it. Why can't our telco, and it's got something to do with mobile phones. It's got something to do with the health uh, issues that are gonna rise from mobile phones and the impact it's going to have on our, on our health. Uh, the links to tumors, cancers, all of these. Insurers won't insure them. That's a really good science question, isn't it, for sustainability? You know, looking at the human endeavour thing, the average Aussie bloke's sperm count since since seventy three has dropped by forty nine percent. That's the so what what are they doing that's causing that? Okay, that's not a personal question, um, but yeah, again, if we look at the research, you know, where does he carry his mobile phones? Cyprus schools in Cyprus have withdrawn Wi Fi from school buildings. You may think, oh wow, that's backwards. They're all goat farmers. Wrong. Racially motivated. The reason they're doing that, of course, is health and well being. Electromagnetic fields. They're, they're, they're con you know, commissioning research into this. They're looking at these kinds of sciences. And look, how can wheat, soy, and other cereal crops uh, you know, that used to be sprayed with Roundup 15 years ago, they now contain Roundup genes. You know, so it's a really interesting process, isn't it? How did we get to this point without anybody noticing or questioning the science behind that? And what will be the accidental byproduct of this? Um, as we know, there's been you know, a lot of detailed research done on, on Roundup recently, and it's almost at the point of being banned here in Australia. And again, we look at genetic modified organisms um, and, and you know, the whole notion of rats, okay, and, and, and testing. I mean, if anyone's watched Rat Park, it's a really interesting movie. It's, rats were used back in the 70s to study addiction. Really interesting example where um, they put rats in a cage and they put one bottle of cocaine injected water, um, another bottle of plain water, and all the rats, of course, love the cocaine and they just go to the cocaine until they kill themselves. And so people assumed that that's what happens to drug addicts, that's why they do it. But then another researcher, um, a New Zealand guy, um, Bruce, someone I can't, Bruce Hamilton, um, came up with this notion that, wait a minute, what happened if we alter their environment? So he reproduced the experiment and he put them in a cage and in the cage he put lots of food, he put lots of coloured balls, he put lots of wheels, he put lots of fun for the rats to do. He created, you know, the Disneyland of rat cages. They called it Rat Park. You know, it had lovely murals and beautiful living spaces. The rats prospered. They reproduced. They had sex. They ate as much as they wanted. And you know what? They drank considerably less of the cocaine-induced water. So when we look at science and we look at, we, we, you know, there's a whole range of ways at looking at science, a whole range of questions and philosophies that we can question. And, and once we work out what science education is for, um, we'll get closer to producing some better science in our classrooms. So, you know, Assyrian talks about the fact that it's the process of facilitating learning. And we're not the only species to transmit knowledge from one to another. We've got chimpanzees, gorillas. There was a gorilla that actually had a vocabulary. I can't remember her name. Missy, I think it was. Um, she died actually about five years ago, but she had a vocabulary of 109 words. She could talk. Chimpanzees and dolphins. 
both teach their young specialised foraging and hunting techniques known only to communities and pods, not across the species. Plants and bacteria. You would have read the news last week, okay, that we now have the ultimate superbug. It's immune to any bacteria we have. In 96% of the countries of the world's uh, nations, 96% um, of those nations actually now have no immunity to bacteria, or all, all of the, the five major um, uh, penicillin, the five major groups of, of um, you know, bacteria resistant drugs have now all been um, superseded by superbugs. They've all learned to adapt. Yeah, and from that we know that you know, therefore learning is a natural part of being alive. It's not unique to us. Humans you know, in their arrogance often say we're the only species that does, but we're not. And again, the role of education is now shifting from a celebration of, of how unique we are to how interdependent we are. That we are one of a group of species really um, with a responsibility for our ongoing future. So we see the emergence of the ACS. We've got utopia rising here. You know, for, for humans to thrive in the future, we will need to systemically rethink education. There are some people in the IT field which actually say schooling is, is, is actually dead. Um, they're, they're moving into an entirely different uh, model of learning. We can no longer rely on schooling to produce learning is their argument. So we've got to provide kids with tools and strategies that need to question the current sociocultural reality. They've got to become leaders and pull us back from the brink of ecocide and usher in a sustainable future. My, my hunch is that's probably too late. I don't know what you think. Now, because there's been a lot of, as the next quote says for, from Asadurian, he talks about the fact there's been so much damage done to human civilization that the students we're working with now, we should be teaching them adaptive. We should be teaching them adaptive strategies. So, you know, they're going to go forward into a world where there's been ecological shifts that are already locked into their futures. And again, one debate raging at the moment is that notion of rewilding versus conservation. You know, conservation is about returning things to the way they were. Rewilding is about allowing things to go wild. And rewilding basically says this, the world is damaged. What we need to do is allow it to rewild and come back in the form that it will. Only that way can it be sustained. Conservationists, however, want to return it to the way it was. Um, so we're seeing a lot of new educational priorities, particularly in science and science literacy. We've got eco-literacy, we've got moral education, we've got systems thinking, critical thinking, all of these things popping up time and time again in our science planet, our thinking. When we look at the planet, um, again, we're locked into here to competing discourses, aren't we? $579 billion a year spent around the world to promote ever-increasing consumption of consumer goods. And estimates of that here in Australia suggest that 60% of all products bought at Christmas finish up in landfill. Okay, not in cupboards, in landfill. So it's really interesting, isn't it, that we're trying to spend our way out of a cycle or, or into ignorance or whatever the issue is. But something is allowing that to happen. And yet we send kids to schools, we send them to institutions. You know, how much are we actually challenging? How real is the education that we're presenting? Um, models are predicting temperature increases two to six degrees and continuing beyond that. We're going to see sea rises, acidification of the world's oceans, dramatic changes in rainfall patterns. We're already seeing that, aren't we, in a drought? And we're also disrupting other planetary boundaries. And here's where science becomes really useful. A lot of this is conjecture. <clears throat> and conjecture is half-truth, misconceptions. We talked about that in, in assessment task number one. What we're now looking at is science. And we can look at phosphorus and nitrogen levels in science. We can talk about it and we talk about the cycles. We can talk about depleting biodiversity. We can talk about chemical change in air, soil and water. We can talk about chemical change at the cellular level of fish. You know, we now know that many species of ocean-dwelling ocean, ocean fish actually have plastic embedded in their DNA. So that's the degree of pollution that we, we've you know, <clears throat> enabled. And uh, Crutzen talks about the notion of the Anthropocene, a new era, a new age. So we've migrated into an entire new situation. Someone trying to ask a question or? That's quite all right. All right, so if we continue and we can look at trends, we've got 83 million members each year, 99.7 billion people in the near future. So we've got to look at new science and, and this is what the Australian curriculum is all about. And this little clip here, what would Australia look like in, if it was just 100 people? 
go and have a look at it. It's, it's actually an Australian Bureau of Statistics video. I won't play it here, um, purely time and interest, but um, it, it talks about the fact that we're becoming a very diverse society. And you know, part of that, for instance, when you look at religion, we have more people who are non-religious. You know, non-religion is the biggest religion in Australia at the moment, and second comes the Catholics. And we have to ask ourselves, is that really a religion? Um, but if you have a look at it, it's a really interesting question. You know, um, oh, by the way, there are also 80,000 Jedi Knights in Australia, according to the census. Uh, you may be uh, amused to hear that, but there are 80,000 Jedi Knights also, so um, which feature as a non-traditional religion in the census. But next week, I point you to um, uh, the Lotox Life site. Now, I do this because it, it, it's, it's science as a human endeavour. Often when we're teaching science, we don't know where to start that with our students. And the lovely thing about toxicity, toxicity of the environment, toxicity of foods, toxicity of air, toxicity even of brains and emotions, um, even though that's not a science, um, we can actually see, for instance, a pseudoscience. But even though it's, it's got scientific claims, um, you know, we can actually use this stuff as the basis for our science inquiry, because what better inquiry is to differentiate between fact and claim. Okay, so that's one of the interesting things. Um, but one of the things we're looking at is, you know, how are we going to provide fulfilling lives for eight to 10 people, even as Earth systems are declining rapidly? They can't be consumer lives, <clears throat> because the more we consume, the worse it gets. But they have to be decent lives. We have to have basic healthcare, education, livelihood opportunities, and essential freedoms. Now, schooling today is kind of ignoring this. It's you know, missing the massive changes. It talks about STEM, it talks about technology, but what it doesn't actually do is talk about resilience and sustainability. And, and these are the, some of the things that we try to bring into the Australian curriculum. So when we look at it, there's a new branch of education coming out called Earth Education. And I was talking with, with the school and, and coordinators at the school last week of, of um, a, a little Montessori college. Um, just outside uh, of, of Butterroom at the Sunshine Coast. Um, and they had this wonderful philosophy um, on, on the kids, for instance, begin each day um, you know, by basically going out into the garden and, and picking the, the vegetables and, and organising materials for lunch. They then come in, they have their first couple of lessons. By the end of the day, you know, they, they, they're cleaning their rooms and tidying up for the next day. So it's all very organic. Um, and when we look at this, you know, this whole notion of what new schooling could do, there's a rich a rich uh, you know, set of literature around it. It's curriculum designed around lessons and projects that maximise education, sustainability for resilience. And it's earth education. Now, this little college is on, for instance, 22 acres of, of farmland and forest. The kids work the farm as part of their education. They do permaculture. They do sustainability studies. They have water treatment plants. They have a whole range of things that they manage on the property themselves. So, you know, and, I, and I'm not saying they're survivalists. It's done from an education perspective. So it, it embraces both resilience, sustainability, and turns it into a really viable education. Now, it's not new. Those who know um, Paolo uh, Freire, um, you know, he talked about um, libertarian education, um, freedom philosophies, and he talked about that right back in the 70s. And there's an element of social entrepreneurship too. These schools are all doing really innovation, change maker stuff. And what they're doing is very solution oriented. And by that, I mean, you know, in business, and I was a business teacher, I must confess, I'd sit down and get students to brainstorm good business ideas. What I should have done was get them to brainstorm bad ideas and then get them to think about how they would turn that into a good idea. Because that's what we're trying to do now. We're looking at the moral, ethical, social, emotional aspects of education. Getting kids to reconnect with nature, getting them to, you know, it's like, like the, the full contact sports, learning what your place in the world is and how much we depend on the planet. And so when we look at the earth education, this, this new philosophy that's coming through, and I'll talk about it more because, believe it or not, it's, it's almost feral here in Australia, particularly in Queensland, this earth education, it's everywhere. And it's growing up as a result of the failure of our school system to address with these, these key issues. People are looking for earth-centric leadership, not every student, but most. And those who are not getting it are disengaging with schooling because they identify the lacking and, and the need. We're looking for deep learning. Why are we here? Who are we? What scientific understandings can we bring to our existence here to enrich it? Creativity. Am I just a lemming, a brain in a jar? Or do I have creative agency in the world? And if so, what science skills are going to give me that? 
are we interdependent or really, you know, is mankind you know, just here to wreck and ruin the planet and do what he wants? And in what ways are we earth dependent? So when we look at all of these principles, they're not new, but they're certainly prolific in schooling. So we talk about schooling and we talk about education. Um, we often think they're the same, don't we? We often treat them as one and the same thing. But if we really analyse it, you know, we're on a continuum where we've got they're two different concepts. We've got educated people and we've got uneducated people. And then we've got schooled people and we've got unschooled people. And really, they're the only valid continuums we have. Schooled people we know are credentialed. We know that they have a scholastic identity, either as a successful student, an average student, or a below average student. You know, don't, don't we all do that? At level, on level, below level, okay, um, and above level. So, so this is how we classify. It's a classification system, okay? Education, however, we have those who are uneducated, could be f you know, formally educated, and those who are fully educated. And for instance, some of these people, as we're discovering, may never go to a formal school. I mean, look at the, the Charters Towers School of Distance Education, two and a half thousand, almost 3,000 students. Brisbane School of Distance Education, not in schools, over 3,000 students. This is becoming a, a more and more prolific phenomenon. So in Australia, where did schooling come from? Everyone schooled from, from home. That was the norm, those who could go to school. But what happened, of course, was the wealthy classes, you know, as we got into, it's again, the social explanations for this, as, as we got into um, <clears throat> industrial organisation and mass industrialization, um, the owners of the capital, the, the business classes, um, of course, needed employees. And the employees, of course, unfortunately, were predominantly Catholic and had lots of children. Um, so it was all right for the industrial class because they had nannies and tutors. Their kids were all, always, you know, in, in the, the study or, or, or in the plantarium. They were always out there having fun with their nannies and tutors. Um, they were getting the education and classical educations too at that. The children were homeschooled um, and the leading class were largely, therefore, unschooled. So they grew up with very three thinking minds. They were change makers, they were innovators, they became industrialists. They had access to a lot of social capital. But with the advent of industrialization, um, the little Catholic kids were running around the streets wild. So our first education act was actually passed to civilize the Catholic masses. It was about bringing the kids off the streets, putting them in a space where they could be controlled while their parents went to work in the factories. And this was the basis of our first education act. So when you look at that, we probably haven't come that far. There are a lot of arguments against schooling. Now, schooling is a form of misopity. Anyone know what misopity is? Anyone like to hazard a guess? Misopity, by definition, really is a hatred of children or, or, or abuse of No, hatred of children is, is probably a better definition. Um, and, and again, when you look at the exponents of this argument, you can see a lot about why it's the case you know it's it, schooling is a fundamental structure in conditioning societal acceptance and, and it, again it supports the domination of children in all social registers now a social register comes from the notion of of Halliday'ing linguistics a, a register is a way of being so kids basically come in to schools and from day one their bodies are regulated they sit in lines outside a classroom they're given a language and a communication system which is deeply restricted whereas the teacher has all access and control of the airspace. These are what we call hegemonic dichotomies. Okay, adult-child, teacher-student, they're power relationships. And in this light, schooling represents the interests of oppression. Now, that sounds a bit ridiculous, but if you think about it, what are kids getting? They're getting access, aren't they? It's, it's really pre-employment training. And we're moulding societal consciousness to accept the conditions of subjugation. Oh, yes, I'm a C plus student. That's what I am. Okay, therefore, I feel better about accepting my job in retail. Think about it. Think about how wrong that can be. Whereas education, rather than schooling, is a process of self-discovery, an awakening to potential, and a desire to see abilities realised. Now, this theory goes all the way back to Aristotle. Somehow, schooling has climbed on top of it. Now, we look at Spr uh, Springer, a, you know, a, a really popular anti-school theorist, um, not anti-education, but anti-school, talks about how schooling can be improved by being more like unschooling. He talks about the subjugation of the child. 
And again, yeah, we've got to look at trying to ensure the absence of coercion in education, now, how kids can go about exploring them, you know, themselves, who they are, how they make decisions, how they, you know, what their interests are, what their curiosities might be. You know, that we go back to our, our quote from, from, um, um, the, the poet we had at the start of the session there, um, the Irish guy, my favourite poet, I can't remember why I can't remember his name, but when we look at their curiosities, you know, this this utopia that we want them to move into, um, and, and yet, you know, mainstream schooling doesn't seem to be achieving this. Around mainstream schooling, we're seeing a growing incidence of alternate programs, Steiner, Montessori, um, I was in Mullaney recently, Mullaney has an alternative school, it only has eight students, one teacher, but basically, you know, and there was one boy there particularly that was an interesting concern. He was sitting there in, in a bear suit, whatever. Okay, the reality is there's alternate schools everywhere. And I'll look at some more examples towards the end of this session. So we're seeing a huge change in how schooling looks. Presenting a broad range of opportunities is important. And again, that's what's happening now. What the petition about what path to follow should be determined by the child. Now, in, in most organised schooling, that's not the case. Okay, it's the teacher who does it. In a lot of independent schools, um, kids are actively at the senior years actually deterred from participating in OP um, uh, courses. And the reason why they're deterred is because their failure reflects poorly on the school's social opportunities and marketing opportunities. So it's really interesting, you know, where schooling has, has gotten to, you know. And when bound to a classroom, we often mistake obedience for education. And that's one of the problems and one of the things Springer writes about in his thesis. So when children explore the world through unschooling, they live in their creative potential. And again, um, Montessori philosophy does this. Um, baccalaureate philosophy does this. The Steiner philosophy. So a whole range of different um, philosophies coming through. And But when we look at schooling, again, just some comparatives here. Most children still li li live their lives chained to a desk. And the function of schooling, look at Springer. Uh, some quite radical quotes here is not to instill an education, but is instead a mechanism through which hierarchy and authority are imparted as if they are their very oxygen and sustenance that sustain their lives. And the cruelty of schooling. Um, you know, Springer writes about the violence of, of schooling. Um, okay, sure, there are incidents at school that are violent, but he's talking here about the mental and emotional violence. And teaching and learning models are built of subordination of children based on the misguided notion that their kids are incapable of autonomy, reinforcing the adult child teacher student split. And, you know, the use of two distinct words, teach and learn, suggests these two processes may be thought of independent of one another. Um, so, yeah, again, so a couple of interesting pe people there, if you're looking for some, some radical theories on education, Springer, Bave, um, two really good theorists that you can rely upon. So where are we going with this? Um, education should not be mistaken for schooling. Um, it is the practice of freedom, the means by which men and women deal critically and creatively. And this comes from John Dewey. You might recognise those words. And Dewey wrote back at the beginning of the 20th century. Alternatively, schooling can act as an instrument which is used to facilitate the integration of younger generation into the logic of the present system and bring about conformity. Paolo Freire. John Holt talks about education as a cipher for the ugly and anti-human business of people shaping. Okay. Rollo, 2015. Now, these are people you won't come across in many educational courses. Okay, they're alternate thinkers. They're change makers. They're people who are putting pressure on the schooling system from the outside. And it's through this understanding of childhood differences in theory that we come to the very idea of progress and development, where the entire notion of human advancement is just as defined through misopathy, through the, the hatred of children, okay, or through the view that children are somehow broken and need fixing. And, you know, we raise the question here, if we look at the ACS, is it institutionalised misopathy? Is the whole principle behind every state curriculum document an assumption that children are incapable of learning of their own volition and free will and determining what, what, what learning means? So it, we're in radical terrain. Okay, and, and you know, we look at Ivan Illich's work from 1971. And school prepares for the alienating institutionalization of life by teaching the need to be taught. So it's teaching compliance. What is the thing we hear coming through all 21st century thinking? You know, that, that students need to be aware, students need to be creative, they need to be innovative. But what we're teaching is a schooling system that promotes the need to be taught. Now, the biggest you know, success for schooling would become redundant to learners. <clears throat> and 
this week on, on the side, I introduced you to John Gatto, a little video there. Has anyone watched the video yet? You're probably all too busy looking at your assessment. That's why I'm throwing this in now. So this week and next week, you can have a look at it. Gatto is a brilliant educator. Um, and he, he talks about laboratories of experimentation on young minds, drill centres for the habits and attitudes that corporate society demands. Mandatory education serves children only incidentally. Its real purpose is to turn them into servants. Now look at the date on that. This is not 1888, this is 2009. And John Gatto made these comments at his acceptance speech when he won the President's Award for Teaching in the US. So, you know, it's a really interesting indictment. This little video is, is quite an enjoyable one and it very much produced by Gatto, reflects his philosophies and well worth a look if you get the chance to look at it. So what am I talking about? Am I talking about something theoretical or something real? Now, these are just a couple of the local initiatives that I've gathered from around at the North Queensland catchment. But, you know, some of us may live near some of these places. We've got Green Edge Catalysts, we've got Barefoot Nature Play, we've got Beach Care, we've got Earth's Cool, the Sea School, Nature Play, Join, Grow. All of these are schools, well, non-schools. Okay, they're, they're social enterprises. The aim of these enterprises is to teach a kind of science and to teach a learning philosophy and to prepare learners for the world that our education system refuses to acknowledge. And these are prolific. They are going, growing dramatically. All of these are little private concerns run by interest groups and, and run by ex-teachers, I hate to say it. But they're seeing the need and they're seeing the light and they're sort of saying, okay, once I leave teaching, my five years is up, okay, I need to go into an environment where I can actually do something meaningful. And they're creating their own schools. And they're getting together groups of kids, they're doing ecology camps, they're full of ecology projects. And of course, we know from our own teaching, once you get kids hooked, you can teach anything, literacy, numeracy, um, everything. So, you know, we're looking, these, these exist now. They're all around our region, around Rockhampton, Mackay, um, Bundaberg, um, Cairns, Townsville. These are only a smattering of them. They're everywhere. And some of you may find yourselves at some stage, I actually know two, Two of my ex-students from, from James Cook University when I was a lecturer there have actually started their own learning centres um, and their own schools. And, that you know, again, they're thriving. They love it. They, they know why they became teachers um, so that they could develop a, a schooling approach and a learning approach um, that met, met their needs. So there are education alternatives to schooling. Um, and as John Kabat-Zinn said, anyone who does mindfulness meditation, wherever you are, there you are. Unschooling is this principle that recognises whatever we are doing, wherever we are, we're always right where we need to be, doing exactly what need to be doing. And, and that's a powerful thing, isn't it? How do you learn? You learn by being in the moment. And schooling it reinforces the excesses and absurdities of a contemporary world because really it's designed to make us fit in. Think about it. Parents get up to drive kids to school. They sit in the traffic. Kids go through the drop-off kiss and, kiss and drop zones. From that moment, their bodies are regulated. Their time is regulated. You know, they're fitting in. They're not thriving. They're surviving. And so, you know, Springer argues we need to put down the curriculum map and enjoy the scenery. Get back to appreciating what it was we have. And doing this without a predetermined destination. And again, he's, he's also a critique of age-based curriculum. So the ACS tries to do this a little bit. You know, it's learned centred, it's inquiry driven, it's open ended, it's got negotiated curriculum units. It's kind of a middle path as the Buddhists would say, but it's not an ideal one. It does promote the absence of coercion and that's positive. It does promote children exploring for themselves and that's positive. It does promote children making their own decisions about what their interests are. It promotes it, but it can't guarantee it because teachers keep teaching science. Okay? They don't teach inquiry, awe and wonder. They teach grey. They don't teach green. And this is one of the big problems. You know, it's the curriculum mandates this, but it doesn't enforce it. And it also suggests, you know, ways. It's got curriculum plans and strategies for how these curiosities might be fulfilled. So the ACS for now is, is what we've got. And it can be used positively. 
So having said that, having wrapped up our understanding of, of where we are with science and, and why we're working on these units, and sometimes it strikes you, you know, it hits you right in the face. You're sitting there thinking, oh, wait a minute, this is not such a good unit of science. You know, do I really like it? Um, I had so many discussions about with people this week on email and by phone doing their tables for assessment task number two and just sort of saying how stiltifyingly boring that is. Well, if it's boring for you as the person who's got to teach it, what's it like for the people who've got to learn it? Now, and these are some of the questions we've got to ask ourselves as, as teachers of science. So when we look at assessment task number two, there's a couple of comments I just want to make about criteria one and criteria two. Because I've had a lot of comments and questions from people this week about um, what's involved. The key thing I want to make is you know, at least four, four items per unit. Now, <clears throat> explanation of the formative and summative assessment used in each. So when I pre presented to you last week, you know, two tables um, in those tables, don't list every assessment item because you're just going to chew up words. You're just chewing bandwidth. Okay, it's like binging on Netflix when you do that. We don't need to binge on Netflix. What we've got to do is put together a table and that table has got to give some examples of formative assessment. Another table gives examples of summative assessment. You've got two different substrands to choose from to, to pick your examples and then a discussion about what those examples represent, what formative assessment represents, okay? And to have that discussion using at least four items, okay? Important, and for the summative and for the formative. You don't need to discuss every assessment item in, in that program. You only need to have to pick out some salient ones and discuss them. Now, I would argue the ones you pick out are also the ones you make recommendations on. Just think about it. You know, if I, if I was going out for, for a three course meal, would my first, my first choice be Chinese, my second choice uh, be a Russian um, stroganoff and, and my third choice, for instance, um, maybe a French cheese platter. Um, you, you're, you're picking from everywhere, okay? It makes no sense. But if, if you're going to go deep with your assessment, you know, try and pick assessment items. It may be too late for you. You may already have made choices, but in, in the tables, try and identify and talk about four items as formative and what they represent and why they're, they're examples and, and what they achieve and what their purpose is and what their engagement motivation features are. Once you've done that, pick two of those to make recommendations on because you've already spent a lot of words talking about them. You don't need to reintroduce them. You don't need to re-explain them. You've done your table. From the table, you've elaborated on four assessment items. And from those four assessment items, you're now going to top it with the cherries of recommendation. So think about that when you're doing this. A lot of students are saying to me, I'm running out of words. Of course you're running out of words if every time you go to do this assignment, for instance, part one where you do the tables and the analysis of units, you've then got to go back to stay back to the beginning to do part two where you're going to talk about you know the, the, the assessment items and making recommendations. Scaffold, build, you know, bring the reader in gradually, build that platform. You know, so when you're doing that, think about that as a strategy. Um, would, you, would I mind explaining the criteria and what you require for the understanding of scientific concepts to elaborate on our units? All right, so this criteria here, we'll go through that. Um, explanation of the formative and summative assessment used in each of the two units of work, uh, at least four items per unit. Notice it doesn't say explain all the formative and summative assessment. Okay, it doesn't say that. Okay, explicit identification of the types of assessment, for, of, and as. Now you can do that by putting a, a column in a table. Okay, so it's not hard to do. So when we look at the, the levels of achievement, sophisticated explanation, okay, uh, of, of the use of formative something used in each of the two units of work. Explicit identification of the type of assessment. So your so sophisticated explanation comes down to those sorts of features that I was talking about. How well do you understand formative assessment? What is its purposes? What does the teacher use it for? How does the teacher you know, align it with, with, you know, to assessment and therefore the constructive alignment of this process? Um, what's strong about, or what's, what's positive or, or strong about your particular assessment task as a formative task? And what's it lacking? So just by talking about those things, it's a fairly sophisticated discussion. Here, here is my formative task. By way of example, you know, here are four examples of, of, of formative tasks in this unit. Here are four here. I'm going to pick this one to discuss. Why? Because it's, an, you know, it's a valuable 
um, insight in, into the, the purpose of formative assessment. What does it do? Okay, it explicitly links assessment to learner behaviour. How does the teacher use it? The teacher uses it in this way. It's a strong tool, it's a strong strategy, a productive strategy, because, however, it also has a structural weakness. It could be stronger because. Now, if you're doing that, that's a fairly sophisticated analysis of a piece of assessment. If you've done it for one, do it for two, do it for two formative and, and two, well, say here, use four examples. Um, you can, again, vary the depth. You don't have to do them all equally. You know, this piece is similar to this assessment task in, in the chemical sciences unit. Both achieve the same purpose. So you can group them and discuss them you're still you're still covering the four items and that's what I mean by sophistication um, you know for instance something that's substantial down here in the third column and you, you know, look you're scoring five out of eight which is a high enough score but something that's substantial is going to go step by step here is one formative task here is what it does here's how teachers use it here's another formative task here's what it does here's how teachers use it. so sophisticated is going to connect them it's going to talk about the strengths. It's going to talk about the gaps. It's going to give some sort of, you know, mosaic flavour to them. These are the, the strong ones, okay? These are the good examples. This is how it connects to motivation. This is how it connects to engagement. Um, here are my references to support this. I'm not saying this on my own. All my, all my research friends are here. And so you're writing all of this down. It's sophisticated. Substantial is, is probably, as you can see, it's a couple of steps down on that, okay? Um, it's used in one or both. So it's, you know, you may have done well in one unit, but not so well in another. Okay, so it's important to balance, you know, and you can group things together, you know, in, in assessment, in, in the physical sciences unit, for instance, maybe melting moments, or okay, that's chemical. It, it, pick one, look at it, identify an assessment task, match it to an assessment task in, an, in, in a chemical sciences unit and say, these can be grouped together. Why? Because they both involve science inquiry skills. What particularly in science inquiry skills do they do? Why is that useful in formative assessment? Because inquiry skills are, if you like, the stepping stones to, to science understandings, and we can use it for that, you know, that sort of analysis. So can I just ask Sarah, is that, that explanation enough, or do you want me to say a little bit more about those? We can see this as a sliding scale as we go, go you know, from left to right. Um, you know, there's more evidence here of sophistication on the left-hand side, and there's less evidence here. In the middle, we've got substantial, where we've got a student who's got the nuts and bolts, got all the low-hanging fruit, but is not making any of the higher-order connections. And so for that reason, of course, there'll be differentiation between the levels of performance. But you can see here, the key thing here is your interpretation of what this criteria is. Explanation of the formative and summative assessment used explanation. Think about what that word means. It means describing it, explaining how it works, and then justifying its use. So there's three phases to that discussion. And again, you're doing that for four items per unit. So that's a pretty comprehensive discussion, isn't it? And again, this second part here, explicit identification, for, of, and as, can be done within the table itself. Moving on to the second criteria. Again, with 16 marks, you can see this is pretty heavily weighted. It's really important you understand this one. Question the assessment examples you gave us had a table, but you said they were soul sucking. Is that because they discussed the motivation engagement in the table? So would you recommend taking that out of the table? Uh, that's a really good question. Again, from Sarah, I would recommend taking it out of the table um, because inside the table, it lacks impact. So I would try and keep my tables illustrative. Um, now, the whole purpose of looking at a table is seeing, okay, assessment items here, assessment purpose here, um, lesson sequence here. Okay, great. Okay, so this student for this, okay, she hasn't done all lesson, sequ all, all lesson sequence, but wow, there's a good comprehensive range of assess uh, formative assessment there, really well, really well identified as formative, um, and I can see where they occur in the session. That would be, for me, an ideal table because it's, it's not complex. When you add another column for engagement and another one for motivation, it starts to look a little bit ugly. They start to work against each other. I would take engagement and motivation outside of the table and I would identify my, my assessment items and group some if I could, but I'd talk briefly about the motivation engagement factor of each and how that 
contributes to formative assessment and then look at the you know the motivational factor each for summative assessment and the engagement factors each for summative assessment so i would take those two elements it's just me you may do it differently and you're not wrong if you do but i bet you're finding it hard to do it that way however if your table was there just as three columns and below that you had a discussion talking about purpose motivation and engagement I think you'd find that a lot easier to write it's just a hunch I know I would but I'm talking from my perspective and you certainly asked me what I thought so it's you know I'm not saying you're wrong to do it any other way I'm just saying it's one way of looking at it so this second criteria yes I'm struggling with the tables and then the discussion yeah um, I would separate them because to put them all in one you know, it, it's it's all right if you you know you're, you're Arabic and come from Arabic countries because you read right to left, but we read from left to right, so there's some cognitive issues there too. Um, I would very much have the table as illustrative, and beyond that, I would give impact to my table, give impact by bringing some references to the discussion where I talked about the nature of formative assessment, why this was a good example, and here's a couple of other examples at different stages in the list sequence, and we can see how formative assessment grows, develops, and feeds into summative assessment. Here's summative assessment. Here's a couple of examples in these two units. Here's why this is a good example of summative assessment, and we can see together formative assessment and summative assessment are aligned, you know, Black and Willem, really important reference. So formative and summative are aligned and therefore are quite useful, okay, in, in, in helping a teacher you know, and, a, and a learner mediate a learning program and develop science understandings. So, um, yeah, 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 I get it too. Yeah, definitely. I'm sorry, I'm just reading the comment on the screen from Bronwyn. Yeah, okay, thank you. I have a reference in the tables and, and it's a little bit stilted. It, it does, I think it gets in the way of your analysis. It's just my my take you may be doing it and doing it fine some students do um, however you know again it, an entire editorial choice that you'll need to make the second criteria we'll try and do a bit more quickly because I notice we're running out of time explanation of how the types of assessment used in the units of work demonstrate student understanding and motor so you can see um, you know those two criteria side by side um, your discussion of motivation and engagement and the purpose of assessment is actually worth twice as many marks as your table and I'm getting emails from students who are agonizing about, you know, my table's not looking very good. Forget the table. Okay, your marker will be happy with the summary table, an illustrative table. Pick some assessment, demonstrate what they are. It's the low hanging fruit. Get it out of the way quickly. And you can see here the, you know, the assessment rubric, 16 marks for criteria number two. So you can do the best table in the world. But you're not going to get more marks for including 15 formative items or four. But you will get marks if your discussion of those four formative assignments, uh, assessment items, is sophisticated and influential. So again, just getting you to see the, the value in, in the, the criteria that you know, here we are, we're bogging ourselves down with, have I listed everything in my table? Have I covered and ticked all these boxes? Keep your table illustrative. Your marker's gonna look at that and say, oh great, the students had a look at that, got over the unit, actually has discriminated, picked out the important ones, said why they're important, said how they work. You know, tell you what, that's sophisticated. Okay, and they've only used four to four or five items. Another student, for instance, has listed 15. And you can't tell which are important, which are not. You can't really tell how they link together because it's not stated. You know, there's, there's no, no discussion of that. Um, and again, that student then is moving to substantial. So we can see the difference in these criteria. So it's really important here you know, to, to look at the, the weighting. So the tables, and, and the reason I'm doing this today is to, to demonstrate the tables, even though we put a lot of emphasis on getting them done, um, it, it's really what you do with the tables that matters. And you see the criteria is actually weighted that way. It's actually worth twice as much. Um, criteria four is also worth saying something about. Okay, clear and concise report presented. Cohesive writing with academic conventions. Extensive use of relevant and credible resources for explanation of scientific concepts. Okay, scientific and slash theoretical concepts. So if you are talking about collaborative learning, source it. And Gregson do not found collaborative learning. Okay, let's just make that, I won't, I won't Gregson bash today. But, but the reality is, um, 
try to avoid using Gregson. Go go one level deeper and say, yeah, look, I read Gregson and I know this assessment is worth 50 marks. So I thought, gee, I better read beyond Gregson. Um, if I'm a proper student, I don't want to be negligent. Um, so I'm, I'm going to actually have a look at, at collaborative learning and, and see who's written in that field and say, oh, yeah, yeah now I know where Gregson's coming from. Um, so again, clear and concise application of report genre. So expect it to be done in report style. There's got to be an introduction and it's got to signpost your response. All aspects of the task have been explicitly addressed and model academic conventions. So this concept of an introduction, again, make sure you, you, you do one. It's really important and you can come out and I would even be so clear and transparent as to identify my recommendations in my introduction. This paper will examine two units of, of science, one physical, one chemical, at such and such a year level. Okay, It will outline the formative assessment strategies embedded in these units. It will outline the summative assessment strategies in, embedded in these units and go on to explain the purpose and function of each of these assessment uh, strategies. How they link to, to teaching and learning and how they support engagement and student motivation. Okay. I will then go on to recommend and, and identify four strategies and based on those four strategies, make recommendations for enhancing uh, the quality and the depth and the integrity of those assessment items to lead to more explicit and, and detailed student outcomes, to lead to deeper conversations and deeper learning uh, events. So that kind of signpost, and then you can go through and identify what they are and keep it brief. You know, collaborative learning supported by peer assessment. It could be a, a e portfolio supported by peer assessment. Okay, it could be self reflection based on authentic learning experiences. Think about what recommendations you're going to make when and where, but keep them short, but preview them in your introduction. That way, your marker is going to have no problem with where you're going. They're going to have no problem whatsoever with going. By your introduction, they're then expecting to see some tables. They're then expecting to see a discussion of formative assessment, a discussion of summative assessment, and some reference to some of the examples that you've listed. Great, so far so good. Well, wait a minute, the students actually picked two of those and they're going to make recommendations to improve them. That's interesting. Hey, that's even sophisticated. Okay, so you're up on the left hand side of the grid where you want to be. And extensive use of relevant and credible sources is really important. You know, you've got to declare your tribe, you've got to point to your tree. When you're writing academically, you can't just simply say, this is because it is. And we talked about this in misconceptions. A lot of students have those macro level understandings where when they observe something, they can sort of say, oh, that is because it is. Now, when you use Gregson or when you make a statement and don't support it, that's what you're doing. You're saying that is because it is. Well, actually, think again. Go a level deeper. Ask yourself why that is. If I would bother to say that, should I then bother to justify it? And how would I justify it? Do I need words or would a simple source? You know, if I point to a tribe and a tree and say, these guys told me to say that, then I can't critique that as a marker. I can only reward it because you're doing the work. So I won't say too much more about criteria. What I'm doing instead is open um, the, the email, open the forum. Um, this PowerPoint is online for you. Um, so you can grab it. So I'll open the forum and invite people to talk about these issues and ask me as many questions as possible. Um, EDCU 13017 as living history. Now this is a, a cute little thing I decided that I was wanted to try. And um, just to show you what this subject used to look like in 2012, little, what were you, can you remember what you were doing in 2012? Seems, seems like a short time ago. Actually it was, it was a long time ago, back before the ACS, BACS as we say to you. And here is, assessment in this course. This was assessment item number two, six years ago. Have a look at it. It's an open book exam. Two hours and you're allowed to, to sit in the exam theatre or sit online with and do your teaching primary science by your side. You've got to put your name. Look at, look at the hegemony here as we were talking about earlier. Now here are you a pre-service teacher or are you being seen as, as a primary or secondary school student? It's really interesting to know. Um, it, it's quite a convoluted, interesting um, message to send learners. Have a look. I, I've actually included the answers in here just so you can have a bit of fun with it. But the questions on chemical sciences, you know, have a look at the questions and, and okay, I don't know the answer. You may think, oh, dash, I'm hopeless at science. Reframe that. Can you find the answer? Do you know where to go and where to look? 
Do you know how to test whether that answer has integrity? Okay. Do you know, again, where that, that, that branch of knowledge fits into a broader context, into a broader frame and schema of understanding? Um, you can see here, this, this is subject back in 2006. Um, right, thank you so much. See you, Candice. Um, back in 2006, this subject you know, also included um, earth and space and biological sciences. And as you can see, that it's all about content. You know, but my question to you is, um, how does knowing the content enable you to teach it? Because let's face it, how much are you going to retain this content? Yeah, and and why are you going to retain it? So that these are all really interesting questions. So when you get a chance, um, do have a look at um, yeah, teacher education as it was only six years ago. Now. I see that comment there, yeah, from Sarah, I wouldn't perform well. I don't think many people would perform well. And if you did, you'd simply be filling your short-term memory up before you went in. You'd be dumping it on the page and coming out with an empty short-term memory. Um, it's really not going to enable you to, to, to deal with complex life skills. So what we're talking about is knowing where to find information, knowing how to break it down, scaffold it, and, and you know, create it in, in, in a, a teaching and learning framework. So um, have a look at that. When I found that today, I, I found it quite by accident. Um, it did surprise me. I thought, gosh, what's that doing in the year 2012? So I was surprised. Um, and what surprised me it was just the pedagogy. Um, it was all about knowledge. Um, how would I fare taking that exam? Well, I gave it a try. And that's what sent me looking for the answers. I did okay. But the reality is I thought, why would anybody want to know that? What's the context of use? Was the science outside my comfort zone? No, but it made me uncomfortable because I found when I was looking at it and doing it, I actually got frustrated with it. I thought, this is not actually helpful. Okay, how is this going to make me a better learner? And in what way is science task aligned to learning outcomes of this unit as we currently teach it? I guess it's not because we're very much here not about becoming an expert in science, but becoming skilled and proficient in knowing how to teach science so that we can pick up any science at any place, any time, and we can find our way to a starting point. And we can simplify and develop a concept map, a chain of understanding. And from that chain of understanding, we can discuss with other learners and identify a starting point, and, and from there, a, a pedagogy of, of learning. So you know, it's really interesting to go back and think just six years ago, that's what we were doing in this subject be interesting to see what the uh, uh, the reviews were. And speaking of reviews, please, that there is a review online um, for this particular subject. So please get, get your opinion in, uh, make your comments, um, make recommendations, give feedback, if something you enjoyed, please let me know if there's something you'd like to see, see changed, please give us that opinion too. You are educators, so your opinion is valued. Um, I enjoy your assignments, I enjoy the thoughts that come through, and I also enjoy your feedback. So please make sure you, you give us some, that would be great. Are there any questions before we exit for the last time? Um, Colin, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, I was just wondering, I just watched your other, your last week's thing before this, and I was just wondering if you remembered where the four stages of learning, like what that's from or who... Yeah, look, I, I can dig out the reference for you. Um, I can even send you the booklet. It's a, it was from an IB seminar. Um, okay. Yep, definitely. So I'll make a note to do that, Sarah, while I'm um, uploading the, the video tonight. Um, yeah, he talks, he actually comes up with his own brain model in that. Um, John, I can't remember his name now, um, from about 2011-12. Okay. Um, he's an educational consultant from South Australia and um, just brilliant at what he does. Yeah. Um, so you'll enjoy his material very much, but I'm happy to dig out a copy of that okay. and shoot it through to you. Thank you. Also with um, the assignment, like I sort of have left this to the lot of, to later, the um, comparing which order to put the two primary connections units um, to say that they're sequential. Um, is that... I don't know, is that marked harshly? Is there much to that? Because I, I looked at their comparison to the um, Australian curriculum and literally every single point that, that they said was like exactly the same for inquiry, inquiry skills and human endeavour or whatever. So it's hard to say that like, you know, one came first. Um, can I just say that 
you start with, like say you looked at the inquiry skills, is that you're just that you're continuing to reaffirm it in terms of like the stages of learning or do you know what I mean? Rather than moving I, from one stage to the next. Yeah, I, I do. And look, can I, can I just fix one thing first? They're not sequential, they're consecutive. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. And that's the term. And consecutive basically means that you're teaching one after the other. Mm -hmm. and you need you need a reason to do that and the reason you're doing that is is perhaps because they they deal with the same science uh, human endeavor understandings or they deal for instance with the same science inquiry skills okay um and and therefore um you know the economy of teaching one one unit will naturally flow into the other because okay. you'll be rehearsing the same science inquiry okay. skills so it doesn't the, really need to be so it's not sequential i guess it's it's yeah, teaching them at the same time because they share the same skills rather than because they have differences in them. Precisely. They have some common ground. And don't spend a lot of time on that. That can be done in one or two sentences. Okay. All right. Well, that's yeah. the same reason I chose this subject after the last science subject because I found it difficult, but I thought while, while it's fresh in my head, I'm going to go ahead and do the next one so that the five E's and everything are sort of more in my mind. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and you picked something really important there, and that's that's why we, you know, why I try to keep the two subjects relatively similar, uh, yeah. even the, even the same textbook, so that we can build on that level of inquiry. So, done sequentially, all of a sudden, the, the second one seems a lot more manageable than the first one yes. be, because yeah. those those memory and and rehearsal strategies are, are laid down. Yes. Yeah. So th thanks for that. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, that does. Thank you. I was really trying to look for the differences in them, but you've pointed out that I can say that it's because of the similarities. That, that that's good. Right, I've got a question. They're saying John Briggs. No, it's not John Briggs. Um, it, look, what I can do is, is um, if anybody wants it, please let me know. I don't, I don't know how much permission I've got to give it out, Bronwyn, but um, certainly it's in the public domain and it's all copyrighted, so there's no reason why I can't email it to people. Um, so I'm happy to do that. Um, so if anybody wants it, just let me know. Um, so it seems like Bronwyn may want a copy. And, um, and who else was it? Sorry, uh, Sarah? It was Sarah Baldry, yeah. Yep, Sarah Dunn, beautifully. So I'll write that down and get, get that to you. And um, you'll enjoy his work very much. Um, he's, he's all about brain-based brain learning. Um, so certainly, and talks about uh, the four stages of learning and the four stages of memory. So really, really good stuff and very yeah. pictorial. Any other questions, please? No other questions? All right, now I'll just talk briefly about next week. Next week, I've actually pointed you towards um, the, the Tox Free website um, and the Chemical Maze app and some of the, the really simple science we can do on projects and, and products around the home. Uh, lipstick, soap, all these things that we put on our body, near our body, um, all the sprays and chemicals and deodorants we use, um, those wonderful spray-free scent removers and all the toxins they, they involve. And, and so these are all really interesting little um, science experiments that we can do. Um, you are not required to do next week. It's not a compulsory week at all. It's just there for people who want to have a look at some science applications when you don't have a laboratory, when you know you, you don't have a lot of equipment, um, and so you can turn the kids loose as scientists in their own home and their own lives. So please keep the, the emails coming through, and I'm happy to um, answer as many questions as I possibly can. Um, and if I can think of anything that's coming through regularly, I'll put it out as a post to people. Um, I do encourage people to post through the forum. I've probably answered 30 emails uh, privately today, and yet some of them were such good questions that I really thought, gee, everybody should see this um, and be thinking about these issues. So if you can, choose the forum. Um, if not, email's great too. So look, thank you all. I'll hit the exit and record button on that note, and um, uh, fabulous. I wish you all well with the assignment. If you have any problems, please, I'm not an ogre, let me know. And, um, and uh, stay in touch, please, above all things. You know, when things go pear-shaped, stay in touch. Um, that's the key to getting through those moments. So please keep me informed. Thank you all and wish you well for the assignment. Thank you so much for another great subject. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for being Colin. there. Thank you, Colin. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.